Hello everybody, my name is Chris Brady, author of the Boeing 737 Tech Guide and the Boeing 737 Tech Site. In this presentation, I'm going to take a close look at the details of MCAS, how it came about and how it works. Please note that I won't be talking about the management decisions by Boeing, the FAA oversight, the blame games, or the regulations put into place since the accident. This is all covered in my first presentation, the 737 MAX and MCAS from development to fix, which is available on my YouTube channel. So how did MCAS come about? Well, back in 2012, so this is shortly after uh, program launch of the MAX, wind tunnel data simulating high-speed wind-up turns showed the shock formation induced in the wing pylon junction would create a non-compliant stick force PG. So let's have a look at those non-compliances. The first one is 14 CFR 25255, which is out of trim characteristics. And this actually says that the stick force versus G curve must have a positive slope at any speed up to and including VFC, MFC. Um, VFC, MFC, for those of you that don't know, it's uh, velocity and Mach full control. And it's usually VMO, MMO equivalent. The second non compliant was in 25143 controllability and maneuverability. Uh, and this actually is probably where MCAS got its name from. Uh, it stands for, for those who don't know, Maneuverability Characteristics Augmentation System. Uh, and this states that when maneuvering at a constant airspeed or Mach number up to VFC, MFC, the stick forces and gradient of the stick force versus maneuvering load factor must lie within satisfactory limits. It also goes on to say that changes of gradient that occur with changes of load factor must not cause undue difficulty in maintaining control of the airplane, and local gradients must not be so low as to result in danger of over control. So this is basically when, when you're applying G, um, and, and that this was discovered at high speed. So where did MCAS come from then? We, we've already established we needed it, but where did it come from? Well, Boeing tried several aerodynamic fixes, but they didn't work. So they actually borrowed the program, um, or borrowed MCAS, from the KC-46 program, the, the 767 tanker. Um, this faced a similar, uh, a similar problem where, when it was going through certification and it was solved with MCAS. The original scope of MCAS on the, on the MAX was actually the same as it was for the, for the KC-46. It was for the high-speed pitch-up case. Um, and these were con conditions that are considered outside the normal operating envelope. And it's worth noting that this original version of MCAS had a G input for activation as well as alpha. So the low speed problem. Um, three, four years later in March 2016, so this is two months into the flight test program, it was discovered that the low speed 1G handling was also unsatisfactory. And what they found was that as you approach the stall, the stick force back pressure gradient uh, reduced or the, the actual gradient reversed. And this was particularly significant at low weight and aft C or G. Cause of this, well, if you recall that the, the, the cause of the high speed case was the, was, was the, the, the Mach shock coming from the, the, the nacelle or the engine nacelle combination. On this, it was actually slightly different. This was the aerodynamic in interaction between the, the, the larger leap engine cells and the midsection of the wings. Um, basically, that interaction was creating extra lift as the, as the stall was approached. Now, this lift, which was forward of the CAG, was manifesting itself as a pitch up, which under certain conditions required the back pressure to be reduced to maintain a steady one knot per second deceleration. That is, uh, is, is non-compliant. So let's take a closer look at this stick force grading problem. 
Now this graph is an estimate of the, the stick force, i.e. The, the required back pressure on the control column to achieve a one knot per second deceleration toward the stall. And if this is in the, the clean configuration. And you can see we've got stick force on the left there, uh, reducing air speed going toward the right. Uh, put some numbers on it for you. Uh, VSW, the, the, the stall warning speed is around about here. And the, the stall break is, is the, clearly shown by the, 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 the drop in stick force. The problem area is here. And that is where you've got an area of gradient reversal on the stick force. And that is non-compliant. The, uh, the CFR's concern for this are 25203 stall characteristics, which says that no abnormal nose for pitching may occur, and the longitudinal control force must be positive up to and throughout the stall, which, as we saw from the graph, it wasn't. Also, CFR 25173, static longitudinal stability. This states that a pull must be required to obtain and maintain speeds below the specified trim speed, and that the average gradient of the slope, of the stable slope, the stick force versus speed curve, may not be less than one pound for each six knots. Okay, so what did Boeing try and do about this? Um, first off was to look for aerodynamic solutions. And the, the following were, were tried and unfortunately didn't succeed. A revised wing vortex generator pattern, revising the leading edge stall strip, leading edge Vortlon modifications. And here are some theories why these solutions didn't quite work. First off, looking at the, the wing vortex generators. Now, the, these are present on the NG and the classic um, and the originals, as, as we know. Um, and they're mainly used to prevent or control flow separation. Um, but the pitching moment non-linearity was before flow separation. All this was occurring before the actual stall. So vortex generators were unlikely to have worked. Second solution looked at we, or we we know they looked at was revising the leading edge stall strip. But if you think about what that does, it it's used to enhance the buffered signal um, by creating a vortex which impinges on the stabilizer. Now, again, the the the, the, the buffered signal that that this um, that this vortex doesn't usually affect the pitching moment. The third thing we know they looked at was uh, modifications to the leading edge Vortolons, and I've, I've shown them here on the on the NG. But Vortolons are mainly used to stop spanwise flow, so they don't usually affect the pitching moment. Uh, nevertheless, they they looked at it, and uh, unfortunately, it didn't work. Now, there are other aerodynamic features on the on the NG. Uh, and also on the max, and these are the engine strakes. So what exactly do they do? Um, so the strakes, or, or chines as they're sometimes called, they're actually very large vortex generators that start to become effective at a high angle of attack. Now they're used to make up for the flow separation caused by the engine masking the wing when at high angle of attack. And if, and if you, you, you picture the aircraft at high angle of attack, the engine, because it's mounted forward of the wing, actually protrudes into the airflow that would flow across the wing. It's believed that these strikes reduce the, the stall speed by around about five knots, um, thereby improving the runway payload performance capability significantly. But the bottom line is that strakes have no effect on the non-linear stick force gradient. Okay, how was MCAS adapted for low speed then? Um, first thing to note is that no input trigger was needed from G anymore, just angle of attack, because th th this wasn't the wind-up turn case. 
if this was low speed 1G stall entry. Secondly, the MCAS authority over the, the horizontal stab was increased from 0.6 to 2.5 degrees per cycle. And this, if you think about it, was because the, the, the original scope of MCAS was for high speed. And it was adapted to, to the low speed case. So that there needed to be greater stab uh, control at low speed than at, at high speed. So let's have a look at the effect of MCAS on the stick force grade. This is the, the graph we've already seen, which is the stick force versus air speed curve without MCAS. And this is what it looks like with, uh, well, actually with, with both speed trim and MCAS. What you've got here is, uh, is, is two, two systems coming into effect. The, the first one is the speed trim system, and this improves the speed stability. So this is keeping that stick force gradient going all the way up to the, the stall one. As the, the speed reduces back to, to VSW, then MCAS starts to kick in. And it's, it's actually blended away from S from speed trim and onto MCAS at around about the stall water speed. MCAS now improves the stick force gradient when approaching the stall. So it's taken away that dip you see in the stick force curve. It's kept the, the stick force gradient positive. One other thing just to note here is that neither STS nor MCAS changes the stall speed or the stall characteristics. It's all just affecting the, uh, the, the stick force gradient before the stall break. One other thing to throw into the mix that uh, you, you probably heard about is elevator field shift. So what exactly does that do? Well, elevator field shift actually applies at that top end of the, of the stick force curve. So from the manuals, when close to a stall, that the SMID operates the elevator field shift manual. It provides an 850 psi A system pressure to the elevator field computer in the dual field actuator to approximately double the force on the stick, thereby counteracting elevator, uh, sorry, control column elevator up movement. And that doubling the force on the stick is what you see there where the, where the gradient starts to increase quite significantly before the stall break. Again, just to, to reinforce the point, elevator field shift acts on the elevator, as the name would suggest, but STS and MCAS both act on the stabilizer. So let's take a quick look at the, um, or recap of those MCAS accidents. The first one was in October 2018, the Lion Air flight, refurbished AOA probe, uh, it was was fitted to the aircraft, but it was miscalibrated 21 degrees too high. In the second accident, the Ethiopian one in March 2019, the Alpha probe failed on takeoff at about 74 degrees. Both aircraft subsequently crashed at high speed after repeated activations of MCAS. So, what did those events look like in the in the flight deck? There were multiple oral and visual warnings, and they included the, the stick shaker as soon as the aircraft got airborne, right the way through to the end of the flight. The difference of 35 degrees between left and right hand flight director bars, and a difference in the PLIs, the pitch limit indicators, or the eyebrows as we know them. There were airspeed disagree and altitude disagree alerts. Master caution, left alpha vein. Uh, th this was on the Ethiopian flight. The AOA disagree alert was was missing an error. Uh, that that was a, an an error in emission by by Boeing, and that, that again was was covered in the previous presentation. Once flap retraction had occurred, MCAS came alive, 
and it repeatedly activated with nose down stick trim, stab trim of uh, around about nine seconds on, five seconds on cycle. That nine seconds on would pause by five seconds if electric pitch trim was used. The crew also will have got the GPWS don't sink uh, shortly after takeoff uh, when the autopilot was, was tried to be engaged and uh, pull up later on. The overspeed clacker was also sounding when above MMO as per design. So let's take a closer look at the, the PFDs. Um, th these are taken from data in the, the accident reports for the Ethiopian flight. So in this case, the, the captain's PFD um, is, is shown where the alpha was 74 and a half degrees. And on the FO side, the alpha was 15 degrees. And this is shortly after takeoff. So th th this is uh, below 400 feet right out. Things to note. The, the the two flight directors are uh, are different. The the pitch bars have been biased out of view, and this was because of the the divergence of the of the angle of attacks. When they when the AOAs start to diverge, that is sensed by the uh, the autopilot flight director system and. While the divergence is happening, they will be biased out of view. Now, above 400 feet, the mode changes from the from the takeoff mode to the uh, to the climb mode. the The system is reset, and there's no longer any divergence. They are different, but the difference is is the same. So the flight directors will come back into the, the pitch bars. The flight directors will come back into view of above 400 radio, albeit with a 35 degree split. Notice also the the difference in the airspeed indications and in the altitude indications. Hence the IS and ALT disagree alerts. So why and how? with the airspeed and altitude affected. So let's have a look at the, um, the, the data and how it's processed. All PITO and Alpha probes and the static ports feed into their own uh, data modules. These convert the sensors to electrical signals for the ADI they use. That's the air data inertial reference units. The ADIUs provide inertial position and track data to the FMS, but they also provide attitude, altitude, and airspeed data to the flight deck displays. The air data reference function of the ADIU, this applies a static source error correction to the airspeed and altitude, and it uses static pressure, total pressure, total air temperature, and most significantly for, for, for this case, alpha, angle of attack. So if the angle of attack data is in error, that error will affect the, the airspeed and altitude on the associated side because of this static source error correction that's applied. For the Ethiopian flight, the airspeed difference was around about 25 knots, and the altitude difference reached 1,250 feet. So I guess the big question is why did MCAS activate with erroneous angle of attack data? Well, the ADIUs were programmed to reject data from an alpha probe only under the following conditions. First, if the resolver input output was zero volts, might have been a, a complete electrical failure of the alpha probe. Or the combined altitude was outside of the acceptable range. Or the calculated angle of attack vane shaft angle is outside of the range defined by the mechanical stops. Any of these conditions would also shut down MCAS as it was designed at the time. Unfortunately, in both these accidents, the alpha vane was still within the acceptable range. So the data was accepted by the ADIU 
and passed to the flight control computer, which triggered MCAS. Okay, let's have a closer look at the, the flight control computer's speed trim and MCAS and the interaction between the three. Another function of the ADIU is to provide alpha data directly to the on site flight control computer as an input to the MCAS function. That's the connection you see there. The speed trim system is part of the flight control computer and it's used, as we've seen, to augment the basic aircraft speed stability during certain low speed, high thrust flight conditions. So this is take off a go around or uh, approaching the stall. It does this by moving the horizontal stabilizer during manual flight. Again, the autopilot not engaged. MCAS was added to speed trim system to improve stick forces when approaching the stall. And this will drive the stab trim motor for up to 9.2 seconds before pausing for five seconds. Stabilizer inc incremental commands limited to two and a half degrees at a rate of 0.27 degrees per second. And if you do the maths, divide 0.27 into 2.5 degrees, that's where you get the 9.2 sec seconds from. The stab trim motor can be stopped by switching off the tab stab trim cutout switches. In this case, the stabilizer control is still available but by the manual trim. Now, as we know, there are two flight control computers on the 737, but only one is active on any given flight. The active flight control computer it flip flops between flights, starting with FCCA from aircraft power up. So flight one will be FCCA, flight two it'll go to B, flight three A, four B, etc., etc. So if there's a failure in the left hand angle of attack probe, or if, if it overreads on the first flight of the day, that will trigger MCAS. And this was the case in, in both the accident flights. If the fault had been on the right hand probe on the first flight of the day, it would have affected the, the first officer's flight instruments, but not have triggered MCAS. Because first flight of the day, FCCA is, is the active flight control. So what changes were made to MCAS to, to, to fix this mess? First, in the alpha system, both angle of attack sources are now used. There's a split vane monitor, which looks for a, a difference of five and a half degrees between the, the vanes. There's, um, there's a new system called the mid value select integrator, which will pick the mid value of the, uh, the two alpha probes and the previous output. And in future, uh, Boeing are going to introduce a synthetic angle of attack source. This will come in from the, the MAX-10 onwards. The next changes were to the flight control computers. They're now dual processor monitors and cross flight control computer monitor. And I'll come on to those in, in the next slide. Next, MCAS has now been limited to one stabilizer trim input per high alpha event. The magnitude of that stab trim input will never exceed the, the command authority or the control authority of the, the control column of the, the elevator input. So it can always be overridden with, with control column. And finally, the, the control column cutout function, which had always been there in previous models of the 737 um, and was modified to accommodate MCAS, has, has now been restored. And I will come on to that in the later slide. OK, so let's take a closer look at this control column cutout function. On all previous 737 models, if the stab was being moved, either by electric pitch trim, the autopilot, or by speed trim, moving the control column in the opposite direction would always stop the stab trim motor. 
Unfortunately, on the max, because MCAS needed to move the stab in opposition to the control column movement, the control column function in the FO switching module was modified to inhibit the aft movement or the, or the aft control column cutout switch when MCAS was active. The, the forward one was, was left as was, but the aft one was the, was the one that was modified. This allowed aircraft nose down stab motion with aircraft nose up control column input. The mechanical control column cutout functions are now replicated using the new FCC software. So this function has now been restored. Okay, let's take a look at the, the cross flight control computer trim monitor. This is a, a totally new feature and it provides additional protection against the erroneous FCC trim commands. So this has nothing to do with, with Alpha. Um, it's actually nothing to do with, with, with MCAS. Um, this, this was um, a feature which was added when the, the whole flight control computer system came under scrutiny as a result of the MCAS accidents. So this monitor, it compares the trim up and trim down command outputs from both FCCs with its own trim command calculation. If the outputs differ from the trim command calculation in the local channels monitor for, uh, for one second, then the local channel will take control of speed trim. The autopilot may disconnect. I said may because it depends which channel is in use, and which was the active FCC. And no autoland will be available. The speed trim fail light will illuminate on recall, and the stab out of trim light will illuminate on the ground within the 30 knots. Cross-channel signals are also added to ensure the standby FCC is in MCAS operation at any time the operational FCC is in MCAS operation. So what this is saying is that both FCCs will be in use for MCAS operation. The standby FCC is there to, perf to perform a reasonableness check on the operational FCC signal to ensure to, to activate MCAS to ensure that the activation difference is not due to uh, a postulate I, I, a random electrical signal FCC failure. Okay, so let's take a look at the new angle of attack processing and failure detection. What I'm showing here is the, the, the normal operation. So each angle of attack probe feeds into the AADI user, as we know, and in there, um, a sense check is done of a failure of the, the probe. If that passes, it then goes to the, the split vane monitor, which you already mentioned, looks for a difference of five and a half degrees. If they're within limits, we then go down to the, the mid-value select integrator. The mid-value select, um, this takes the, 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 the the mid value of three figures, the left probe, the right probe, and the previous output. Um, best way to explain this is by putting some numbers on it. So if, if the if the left probe was previously two degrees, uh, the right probe was three degrees, and the previous mid value figure was five degrees, then the mid value of two, three, and five is three so that is the output value and that figure three is then fed back into MBS for the, the, the next calculation so that's normal operation now if an alpha circuit failure is detected the FCCs will only utilize the the, the good angle of attack value for MCAS. As you've only got one angle of attack value, the split vane monitor and MBS are, are bypassed. The, 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 they have no function anymore for this. MCAS will still has still been programmed to operate on a single angle of attack probe because the it has been deemed that the, the, the chances of, of two independent failures in this are remote. 
So under these conditions, in these conditions only, MCAS will, will operate from a, a single angle of attack probe. Although don't forget that the, um, the, the, the FCC monitoring, the cross FCC monitor will still be there. In this case, uh, we'll get mast caution speed trim fail. On, and this is on recall only. So th th this will be picked up in the um, set approach checklist. Similarly, if the, uh, if the left alpha failed, then the, the MCAS would receive direct, uh, data directly from the right angle of attack probe. Okay, so let's look, look at this split phase monitor. If it detects a difference in the in the angle of attacks uh, data of more than five and a half degrees for a specified duration, both MCAS and STS functions will be disabled for the remainder of the flight, and mast caution speed trim fail will illuminate. And then, uh, if the SVA the split phase monitor is, is passed down to the MV, MVS integrator. And as previously stated, this will give you the mid value of the left and right angle of attacks and the previous MVS output. So all in all, it's a, it's a far more robust angle of attack processing and, uh, and failure detection system than, than was there before. Let's take a look at actions that were taken beyond fixing MCAS. Um, an explanation of MCAS was added to the FCOMS, the maintenance manual, and the interactive fault isolation manual. No less than eight QRH procedures were revised, um, and the list is there. Looking at these um, individually, the airspeed and reliable checklist there was a, a step added here which allowed the flight crew to determine a, a reliable airspeed indication without referring to the pitch power reference tables. And um, those of us that have done this in the sim who've, um, who've tried to use these pitch power tables um, with, with, a, with a real airspeed unreliable case going on will we'll, we'll know that this is not a straightforward task. So this basically gives... Um, authority to the crew to do a common sense check of the of the two airspeed indication and, and, and for them to decide and say which one is 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 good or or bad if they're able to do so if if they're not then the checklist takes them through that step as well okay the next three are all related um alpha altitude and airspeed disagree these have all been changed to direct the flight crew to accomplish the airspeed on reliable manual checklist. Speed trim fail, um, QRH drill, there's an added note to say that STS and MCAS are in off with speed trim fail. Stabilizer trim in off, uh, there's a note added to say that reducing airspeed will ease the effort of manual trim. Now this this is a very significant point and is probably worthy of, of, of re-emphasis. In the Ethiopian accident, at, um, at, at some point into that flight, the captain directed the, the first officer to switch off the stab trim cutout switches. And this was done. But when the first officer tried to use the manual trim wheel. He was unable to do so because the aerodynamic loads on the stabilizer were so high, he felt he was unable to move the, the stab trim wheel. Now, in actual fact, it, 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 it wasn't jammed, and with a, with a two-handed effort, or perhaps even a two-man effort, he would have been able to have, have moved that, that trim wheel. But the... It, it, it's understandable why he, he, he thought it, 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 it was unable to, to move. This, this note here draws attention to the, to the fact that if airspeed is reduced, 
the movement of the manual trim wheel will be much, much easier. Stabilizer out of trim. There's um, an added note for the ground illumination of this, uh, this, this light, which is alerting crew for the, the, the new cross FCC trim monitor. Again, the, the, this is a new system, and, uh, and if there's a, a, a failure or an error in this, it will bring on the stab out of trim light once the aircraft is on the ground. And finally, the runaway stabilizer procedure. This has been extensively changed. Um, it's, it's now quite a, quite a large uh, procedure. The condition statement is modified to include situations when uncommanded stabilizer movement con occurs continuously or in a manner not appropriate for flight conditions. Now, this is significant because if if you ask crew what a an, or, or you know pre pre MCAS days you know pre pre max days if you were to, to say what is a runaway what does a runaway stabilizer look like most crew would probably say a continuous uncommanded movement of the stabilizer trim but in actual fact with with MCAS it wasn't a continuous movement it was as we've seen, 9.2 seconds on, 5 seconds off. It was an intermittent, uncommanded movement of the stabilizer trim. And the condition statement now covers that. The non-normal checklist is also reformulated to move existing text for controlling pitch attitude with the control column and new text to control airspeed with the thrust levers into a newly created memory step. So there are, there are more memory steps added to, the, to this, uh, this procedure. In addition to using main electric trim to reduce control column forces. So main electric trim obviously is still available before the, the stab trim cutout switches are, are, are used. Next, there were AFM limitations revised for single uh, channel autopilot operation. This again, with nothing particularly to do with MCAS. That this was one of the things discovered um, on closer inspection of the flight control computer, and this this is partly what the FCC monitor is for. There were ten MMEL restrictions added. Um, I won't go through them all individually; they're there on the screen for you to see. Um, but in essence, the, these are, are uh, increasing the, the, the importance and, and, and making the, the, the aircraft uh, not dispatchable with the stab trim, stab out of trim light, and speed trim fail light, and, uh, and various autopilot sort of modes. The pilot type conversion rating must now cover STS and MCAS, uh, also crew procedures and the related software changes. So pilots were, who are already NG or MAX qualified, they will require five hours of transition training, which uh, is to include three hours of sim briefings and live scenarios and two hours of CBT work. The CDS software, that, that's the, um, the, the display software, must be updated to make the angle of attack disagree alert standard on all aircraft. And it must include a free option for those that want it to have the AOA display. And finally, a computerized synthetic third angle of attack sensor system will be added from the MAX-10 onwards. Once this is in place, this will be retrofitted back to all the other MAX models. So again, just having a quick look at the, the, the timeline of the, of the MAX and, the, and, and MCAS. As we see on the bottom there, MCAS uh, was originally added shortly after launch of the MAX. It was uh, 
it was modified for low speed stalls March 2016, shortly after the first flight. Then, uh, around about 18 months after the after the grounding, the second accident, it, MCAS was rectified. Uh, An ungrounding took place uh, round about two years later. It, the aircraft was grounded for a, for a very long time, best part of two years. So I guess the question is, is why did this fix take so long? The, the primary fix to the flight control computer to, to reprogram the MCAS and that alpha logic, as, as I've explained in, on the previous slide, that took around about a year. Um, but in April, uh, Boeing said that it would need to update the FCC software to, to address two separate issues. One that could lead to a runaway stab, this is not MCAS related, and the second that could lead to disengagement of the autopilot feature during final approach. These issues delayed the release of the FCC software. And it was, it was, these were, Boeing found that the, basically a single FCC was not up to the job. And they had to work out a way of getting the two FCCs to talk to each other. That that was the the, the real time consuming part. Anyway, the um, the certification test flight took place uh, in June 2020, but it took until the 18th of November for the ungrounding AD to be issued, and the 9th of December for the first crew to receive the new training and the first, the first revenue flight to happen. The revised design of the MAX took more than 375,000 engineering and test hours and 1,300 test flights. That's about 4,000 hours of test flight. It was a heck of an undertaking and the grounding lasted around two years. The question I'm so often asked is is the the max now safe uh would i fly it would i put my fa family and friends on it and for me the answer is now absolutely yes i believe the max is safe i believe mcas is a robust system and i have no doubts about the the present design of the aircraft However, let's not forget, 346 lives were lost in the two accidents. And it's estimated to have cost Boeing around about 30 billion US dollars in development costs, lost orders, fines and compensation, plus some determinable reputational damage. All of this could have been avoided by having an open and honest safety culture and not succumbing to commercial pressures. And this is a, a lesson that really everybody um, in, in any industry uh, should, uh, could and should learn from. This is, this is not necessarily just a Boeing issue or um, you know, an, an, an Airbus issue, if God forbid it should happen to them. But it, it's, it's across the whole of aerospace and really across the, the whole of, of, of every industry. There are huge lessons to be learned here. Okay, well, I hope that presentation has been useful and you've learned something about the, um, the MCAS system. I say don't forget to check out my YouTube channel for details on the, the background of this and for upcoming videos on the, the Max. Thank you very much.